New York Giant fans, I'm not happy. I am not happy. Not happy at all. Should have won this game. Giants lost by a score of 13 to 10 in overtime. Welcome back to the Big Blue in the Bronx podcast. Hit the like button, folks. Comment, subscribe, share out. Five stars on Apple Podcasts. Do all the good stuff. And again, share out. We appreciate you guys. Um, at this moment, we're still a few subs away from the 1.6K mark. So if you haven't already subbed, please do it. And also, share out to other people. Get them a sub. Your dog, your cat, your hamster, your guinea pig, your ferret, your rat. If you have rats, I mean, that'd be a bad thing. But nonetheless, people have rats as pets, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to talk about my experience at the game probably firsthand. And then I want to get into the stats and get everything else. Because even though I kind of let off some steam on the Boys and the Big Apple podcast, I still have a lot of steam to let off on here. And it just still boggles my mind that certain decisions are made. Certain people act certain ways. All that stuff. So I, I want to talk about my experience the game just for 20 seconds, maybe a little bit more than that. For those of you who don't know, I went to the game as a credentialed media member. And I would say that part was fun for the most part. Um, the Giants MetLife Security gave me um, a busting of balls, to be honest with you. Uh, because uh, my boss had... Set up with the Department of Communications for the New York Giants that you know I was supposed to get tickets at a certain spot, but they denied me twice, and then I had to actually call her and say this is what's going on and whatnot. But uh, you know, shout outs to uh, Maddie Harris, who if you guys listen to like the Giants press conferences virtually, and there's a woman saying like for instance, you know, Art Stapleton from the record, like calling you know the names out. That's Maddie Harris. Um, but with that being said, you know, shout outs to her, shout outs to uh, my boss. Um, who's been, you know, making this stuff happen, um, got in the parking lot, obviously he found my parking spot, went into the stadium, uh, picked up the press pass, did all that stuff, dropped the stuff off in the room. I got to introduce myself to Carl Banks and Howard Cross, two former players who are doing the Giants WFAN coverage. Um, I wanted to see if Bob Papa was there as well, but obviously that was not the case. Um, at least, you know, in the, the press area before they went in for the, the game cast and all that sort of stuff. So they were nice. Um, obviously, I'm a big Notre Dame fan, so I let uh, Howard know. I'm like, listen, I'm rooting for your son. Uh, you know, best of luck and everything like that. So uh, the food was okay. The food was okay. I'll, I'll give them that. Um, the chicken was good. Um, the waffles were good. The bacon was good. And then, you know, I guess like the most thrilling part of it, and it's not necessarily like a good thrill, but it's just like an energetic thrill, was at the end of the game, or at least we had five minutes left to go, and this is a true story, guys. Five minutes left to go. Um, we went downstairs. It was like, okay, we just got to set up everything, the cameras, the mics, and all that other stuff. And, of course, we had to do a post-game report afterward. But we went down there. MetLife Stadium Security, again, directed us in 1,700 different friggin' directions. So that's something they need to key up on. Nonetheless, going to the locker room. Well, not in the locker room, but I, I think the locker room is adjacent to the press conference room. So we do that, um, you know, and of course I saw the Giants collapse on somebody else's phone. And we were just like, dude, what's going on with this team, man? You know, they, they dropped the ball. They dropped the ball. Once the Adoree Jackson pass interference penalty happened, I said, this is the game. This is the game right here. But, um, you know, everybody in the media started filing in, you know, your basic beat reporters like Rafa Cayano, Jordan Renan, um, Pat Leonard, all those different guys. And uh, I asked three questions of Brian Dable, which I think were critical questions. And, you know, I don't really toot my own horn that much, but, of course, I posted them on Twitter. Um, the first question I asked, which we'll definitely get into, is, you know, why didn't you trust Tommy DeVito? And, you know, if you didn't trust him, why not sign Matt Barkley? Why not, you know, go all these different other routes? Uh, because Tyrod Taylor is an injury-prone quarterback. My second question, and maybe I'll post the links. Maybe I'll post the links in the video. If not, you know, you guys have it on Twitter and whatnot. Um, the second question was, are you going to bring in some backup quarterbacks? Because the Giants will possibly need some. Are you going to bring in some backup QBs um, and some kickers? That's another one. I said, you can bring them some backup QBs and kickers for workouts. He said, that I understand the question. We're not there yet. And the third question to Brian Dable was, you do realize that some of these decisions against Buffalo, against some of these other teams, and these low-scoring close games – are very critical and they come back to bite you especially when you have momentum riding on your side and he gave me a longer answer for that one 
Um, and then I got to ask Tommy DeVito a question or two. So that, that was fun. But, you know, before we get into all that stuff, I just want to say I appreciate you guys very, very much. And I say that every, you know, during every video, every podcast episode, because I do. And the amount of overwhelming support I got uh, on Twitter by, you know, different guys like Justin and Bobby of Talking Giants. Uh, some people who have done work for the channel before and, and, you know, are no longer with us. And, you know, just all fans saying, hey, you asked a hard question. I'm very proud of you. Also, Pete and Christian of NYY News TV. Well, actually, no, it's NYY News Underground. Um, you know, they were saying, hey, you know, Alex is the man and all that sort of stuff. But And also the Big Blue Crew. I have to shout out the Big Blue Crew, too. So, anyway, thank you guys for that. Um, let's go over the stats before I go over anything else. We're going to do a little out of tradition today. We kind of already started out of tradition. But, um... Zach Wilson, 17 to 36, under 50% completion, 240 yards, and a touchdown. Tyron Taylor, 4 of 7, 8 yards. Tommy DeVito, 2 of, two of 7, uh, negative 1 yards. Four sacks for each quarterback. Actually, not each quarterback. Four sacks for each offense. Uh, Zach Wilson got sacked four times. Tyron Taylor twice. Tommy DeVito twice. The rushing game. I will give the Giants credit, and I kind of called this out. A lot of people didn't listen to me. It's the one thing I got right. Brees Hall was not explosive this game. The Giants pretty much shut him down until it came to the passing game, that one check down. Uh, Zach Wilson was the lead carrier at four carries, 25 yards. Brees Hall, 12 carries, 17 yards. Dalvin Cook, two carries, five yards. So they neutralized Brees Hall. And this is, you know, it could be two different things. It could be the Giants just being really good against the run lately. It could also be that Nathaniel Hackett was a little predictable on the play calling, you know, first down and second down runs. And also for the Giants rushing game, 3.6 yards per carry for Saquon Barkley. uh, 36 carries, 128 yards. Tyra Taylor, 5 carries, 33 yards. Uh, Tommy DeVito had a rushing touchdown. For the Jets receiving game, Garrett Wilson, 7 receptions, 100 yards. Brees Hall, 6 receptions, 76 yards. Obviously, the 50-yard touchdown was big. A lot of missed tackles there, but I'm not going to critique the defense too much. Uh, For the Giants... Yeah, two lead receivers, Matt Breida and Darren Waller, reception for four yards. My God, was the offense fucking terrible. <laughs> for the fumbles, uh, Zach Wilson lost two fumbles. One was the snap, and Michael McFadden picked that up. And one was the fourth fumble by Kayvon Thibodeau in the first drive of the game. And Joe Hodward picked that up, and Tyra Taylor fumbled once he recovered it. And then also uh, Gunnar Olszewski, he fumbled supposedly, but I guess I may have been out of bounds because no giant picked that up. For the defensive side of the ball, let's start with the New York Jets. They had four sacks, half a sack for C.J. Mosley and Quentin Jefferson. Jermaine Johnson had two sacks, four quarterback hits, and two tackles for a loss. Um, you go to other defensive players who had a sack. Bryce Huff, a sack, a tackle for a loss, and a quarterback hit. Multiple tackles for a loss for the Jets, 13 in total. Michael Clemens, Ashton Davis, Sauce Gardner, John Franklin Myers, Bryce Huff is aforementioned, two for Jermaine Johnson, two for Jordan Whitehead, one for Quentin Williams, one for Tony Adams, and two for Quincy Williams. Quarterback hits, they got eight, um, four for Jermaine Johnson, one for Bryce Huff, one for Quentin Jefferson, one for Quentin Williams, and one for C.J. Mosley. For the Giants' side of the ball, Kayvon Thibodeau, three sacks, three tackles for loss, three quarterback hits. Bobby Okereke and Thibodeau with the lead tacklers at nine. Uh, Dexter Lawrence had five quarterback hits, a tackle for loss, and a sack. You go to tackles for loss, Giants had eight tackles for loss. Sean Robinson, Dexter Lawrence getting one each. And Bobby Okereke, three tackles for loss. Kayvon Thibodeau, three tackles for loss. And quarterback hits, Kayvon Thibodeau with three, five for Dexter Lawrence. Jason Pinnock had one, and that was it. Um, because this is important, we'll talk about it. The Giants punted 13 times. Jamie Gillen had 549 yards on punting, 42.2 yards per punt. And his longest was a 58-yarder, five inside the 20, four inside the 20 for Thomas Morstead, 11 punts, 529 yards, 48.1 yards per punt. He did a little bit better than Gillen, but Gillen punted more and got more rusty. I don't blame him. Four punts inside the 20, longest was 55. Now we'll get to some of the more depressing stats before we get to the good of good, which is really the bad. First downs, both teams had 12. The Giants didn't have a single passing first down, no surprise. Um, The Jets had eight. Giants had seven rushing first downs, two for the New York Jets. Uh, First downs from penalties, that's where the Giants got gifted. Five first downs from penalties, two for the Jets. Giants two for 19 on third. 
two for 15. That was the Jets on third, fourth down. The Giant, uh, the Jets were 0 for 1. Obviously, the sack of Zach Wilson and the Giants didn't go for it all on fourth. Total plays, Giants ran 70, 62 for the Jets. Giants had 194 total yards, 251 for the Jets. 17 drives each, 2.8 yards per play for the Giants. Four for the Jets. You move down more. Red zone, Giants were 1 for 3, 0 for 2 for the Jets. And penalties, 9 for 85 yards. The Jets, the Giants, 6 uh, penalties for 73 yards and 2 turnovers for the Jets. So the Giants still won the turnover battle, but they didn't get the win. Giants, 38-13 on the time and possession clock, 25-38. So usually I start with offense. Usually maybe I'll start with defense sometimes. Um, But I'm going to start with the coach. I'm going to start with Coach Dable because maybe you could say it's a fact. But, of course, you know, that's not the real definition definition of a fact. It's more of an opinion thing. But the consensus that I will take to my grave, I know that's a bit of a deep subject for no reason or a deep saying, but I will hold on to this um, if everyone, anyone ever brings it up again. Brian Dable lost this game for the New York Giants. The players obviously had poor execution at certain points in the game. But Brian Dable lost this game for the New York Giants. Anyone else who disagrees, go in the comments section and write me and tell me your thoughts. Because I want to see your argument. And I've gotten, you know, Giant fans uh, on my Twitter and it's fine because, you know, homerism is a viral disease. You know, tell me, oh, you're not the coach, you're not the GM, you know, what is Dable supposed to do in this situation? It's like, no, no, let's start with point number one, folks. Let's start with point number one. And that's Tommy DeVito. And that's the first question I asked. I said, look, you guys brought in Matt Barkley. Why did you not trust Tommy DeVito? And, you know, also what everyone else could have asked in that beat room was, why not take a deep shot? You didn't take any deep shots with Tyrod Taylor. And trust me, there's a lot of things we have to get with Dable. So if you're thinking, oh, we got to get to this, we got to get to that, we will get to that. Um, But with that being said, sorry, there's a fucking fly my way anyway the Giants for most of the game most of the game were playing friggin keep away how long did Brian Dable think that was gonna last and he did say he didn't say keep away but he said oh you know we wanted to play old school and his his response to me was you know uh we 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 anticipated that the game was gonna be like this the weather played a factor and you know kind of an old school type play for football and all that sort of stuff and a lot of people justifiably so took to twitter and said what the hell kind of an answer is this it's basically shearing away from the question acting like a politician because you got caught and i made you think like again i'm not trying to root my own uh, to my own horn but if somebody else asked this i would have said hey listen creds to them but my specific question also in there as well was tommy devito the last two, three weeks, we know Daniel Jones has been out. We know Tyrod Taylor has been injured before. Brian Dable saw it with his own eyes last year against the, uh, the the Bears, where Tyrod Taylor took a spill and the Giants didn't have a quarterback. And obviously this new emergency quarterback rule and all these different things and whatnot. And that was different in a sense because the Giants were winning and they didn't have you know an emergency third quarterback and all these different things and the giants were still a different team then they were a winning football team as to this it's tommy devito not only did you not prepare him just in case tyro i got hurt he's an undrafted free agent you had him all of camp you had him all of camp okay so he should know the playbook and yeah he looked a little frazzled to start in camp and then the preseason games wow this kid looks good against second and third stringers but if you were not confident and he it's not like he was with the bears or with the lions or with the jets no he was on the giants practice squad so he must have known the playbook and the giants must have had some sort of gut feeling hey we're gonna bring this guy back on now i don't know if there's a cap situation that we're not talking about but honestly with this leonard williams trade that happened should free up some cap yeah, the Giants will eat some, but it should free up some cap. The Giants should go out there and you know sign a veteran quarterback because Daniel Jones is coming back. 
Do you trust DeVito? DeVito is not on the 53. He ran out of elevations. He had three. He had uh, the Bills game, he had the Commanders game, and he had the Jets game. That's three elevations. You can't bring him up anymore unless you sign him to the active roster. That's the rule. And they already cut Olszewski. They brought on, I can't even remember the guy's name. Stanley Thomas Oliver, I think his name is. He's from the Panthers. Didn't work out there as a draft pick. He's a special teamer. Which is kind of interesting to me, being that there's more needs on this roster. But I guess veteran minimum, they want to do that. But the sense of playing keep away was utter nonsense. It was utter nonsense. If you don't trust the kid, don't make him your second quarterback. This is kind of like we've been talking on the Boys Big Apple, po- Big Apple podcast. Oh, the, you know, the, Zach Wilson this, Zach Wilson that. Uh, he shouldn't be the backup quarterback. The reason Giant fans weren't talking about this, and me, and I take blame, is that this hit us right in the face. This hit us right in the face to where we wouldn't be worried about it. And also, maybe we would have, or maybe we wouldn't have been worried about it if they actually let Tommy reign. If they let Tommy come into the game and actually throw some passes. You know, if he throws an interception, I mean, the game's over anyway. And I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, this kind of thing, oh, just throw an interception, you know, you would blame the coach. No, I wouldn't because they would say, okay, Tommy DeVito, you know, show us what you got. Show us what you got. And, you know, if he throws a deep pass, throws an interception, that's a fucking punt anyway. You're saving Jamie Gillen an extra pressure on the left leg. So that's just that. And just to sum it up, Tommy DeVito, him not being ready, you're playing keep away against the Jets who have an equally good defense, if not better, and then even during the game, you don't take a shot to Tyra, from Tyrod Taylor. You don't take a shot from Tommy DeVito. The, the thing that blows my mind is you could say whatever about Tommy DeVito. Tyrod Taylor, he's got a solid arm. You're showing the defense that you're fucking scared of them. That's what you're showing. You're showing the defense. You got two good corners. Oh, no, no. We're going to play scared. We're going to play scared. Maybe Jalen Hyatt would have beat Sauce Gardner like he did in the preseason. Maybe he would have beat DJ Reed. Maybe if you get it out, maybe you actually would have had a chance. And the offensive execution was poor, let's be honest. But still, still, I'm going to go to this now, which is a big one. And a lot of people have been arguing about it. Let's talk about Graham Gano and the whole situation, the whole debacle there. Sunday morning, Art Stapleton tweets out that Graham Gano told him he has a swollen left knee. And that that's going to have to be surgically repaired in the offseason. My question is this. Why have you not brought in kickers? He's going to tell you he's fine to kick. He's going to tell you that. That's that's what he's going to do. Most people will do that because they want to stay on the field. And it will hurt them, but they want to be you know team players. They don't want to be you know the guys that let down the team and whatnot. Whatever. You're injured, it's a different story, but I get the athlete mentality. Why wouldn't you bring in a couple other kickers and say, okay, we'll see what happens. And people said to me, oh, you know, you think Dable's just watching him miss kicks in practice? He's injured. He's injured. And clearly, there's like two sides of the argument. So, if he's injured, it goes into the another argument, whether he's missing kicks or he's injured. Why are you coaching scared on fourth downs? Repeatedly. Graham Gano has missed six kicks in eight games this year. Two against the Jets. Obviously, going back to that game against the Cowboys. I don't think he missed one against the Cardinals. He might have missed one against the 49ers. Missed one against the Seahawks. I think he missed one against the Dolphins. Maybe, maybe not. I know he hit a couple of ones, like 50 and 50-something. I I forget which game that was. Uh, Against the Bills, he may have hit. And then the Commanders, he missed a kick. So it's like repeatedly that he's missing kicks. And whether he's injured or not, again, why are you not going for fourth and one? Why are you not going? I'm not asking you. I'm not asking you to go out here fourth and five and make a conversion. Obviously, at the end of the game, you will have to do something like that. But the Giants were never put in that situation because they never, you know, were amounted to that. But against Buffalo. We could talk about the first half miscue. Fourth and inches, you're kicking a fucking field goal. And the momentum was on your side, right? The momentum was on your side. Saquon Barkley had a 53, two carries of 53 yards. 
on that drive. And the Giants went down there. They obviously had a couple of penalties on the defensive side of the ball for Buffalo, which put them in prime position. Fourth and inches, you're not going for it. I mean, I get it. Your offense is struggling, but at that point, let's see, Buffalo, that was what, week six? You're one and four. You're one and four. Who gives a shit? And, you know, week, what was it? Week eight again. No, not week eight, because this is week eight. Uh, week seven against the Commanders. The Giants could have put that game away if there was, I think they was a fourth and one or fourth and inches or something like that. And I believe they punted. They punted. And people were calling out people, you know, certain beat writers like, hey, you're, you know, all these mouth breathers that talk about uh, field goals and stuff like that. I'm like, well, when your offense flat out sucks and your kicker has not been making kick, has not been making kicks. I mean, what are you supposed to do there? What are you supposed to do there? You're supposed to go for it. We we came out here and praised Dayball, Dayballs, right? You know, that was week one last year. His balls have shrunk, if anything. So there's that. Coaching scared. That I cannot take. That I cannot take. I will continue to rip on the Giants if they're going to sit here and keep doing this. Because either you bring in a new kicker, and even if you do bring in a new kicker, I mean, you should still be going for fourth and inches, fourth and one. And he said this in his response to me. He said, you know, yeah, the running game, this and the other thing. Okay, you made Saquon Barkley carry the ball 36 times, Matt Breida portion, and all, so on and so forth, okay? How come you didn't have the confidence in the offense, or Saquon Barkley for that matter, to get an inch or a yard? I mean, seriously? I mean, it happened twice. Second time, I can't blame him too much for. But the first time? Unbelievable. Let me get into this one. Daniel Jones, and this is not just Dable, but it's the training staff too. What is the routine with these injuries? What is the routine with these injuries that there's a random checkup on Sunday? And, you know, people will give me, yeah, you know, you really can't. If the player is cleared that day, they cannot play. Apparently, that's an NFL rule. I'm like, okay, you know, you do what you do, right? Um... And that came out Monday morning, but it was reported that Sunday he was cleared, but Dable didn't find out after the game. So what is Ronnie Barnes doing in his morning, or what is Daniel Jones doing in his morning that he can't take a routine checkup and maybe be ready? And here's my question too, because it all twirls in. He was questionable. He was questionable versus the Washington Commanders. But he was out against the Jets. And now that he's cleared, something's something's going on. Because how can your status change drastically from Friday where you're declared out to Sunday, Monday, where it's like, yeah, we're going to practice with Daniel Jones all this week. He's going to be ready to play. Something in that locker room is going on. Something in that training room is going on. Because somebody ain't telling us a goddamn story. Whether you want to talk about the conspiracies of whether Jones is coming back because Andrew Thomas is coming back. Or is it because, hey, uh, they want Tyrod as a starter. You guys make your own theories. But I'm just calling it out as is. I'm calling it out as is. It's just basic facts. And let's go to this one. This is a minor one, but it's also a major one if you look at it. Darren Waller exits the game. The Giants are stuck with Daniel Bellinger as the only tight end. He's the notable fullback. So in jumbo packages, they got to go out and bring out Marcus McKeithen as an extra tackle. Please tell me as to why you didn't elevate Lawrence Cager. I mean, you played with, what, three rushers against, what was it, the Commanders, right? It was Basham, it was Ward, and it was... A guy in Kayvon Thibodeau. So there's that. And why not have Carter Coughlin play the edge? And just say, hey, we're going to elevate Cager. Why only two tight ends? Why? Please tell me the ethics and logic in that. Especially if you know you're going to run the football a lot. Especially. The Giants got to sign a blocking tight end. I mean, that's just, that's just where that goes, to be honest with y'all. But... That's my critique on Brian Dable. That's my list of critiques. I'm not saying I want him fired because that's just childish to say, right? I think that's blown out of the water, blown out of proportion. But to start questioning him on these conservative decisions, 
I think a lot of Giant fans have that right. And if you want to start questioning him, start questioning him. I honestly think that it would be the best thing. And if I go there again, which I hope so, whether it's against the Pats or this team or that team, whatever, um, I'm going to be still asking the hard questions if he's still making these decisions. So there goes that. But to briefly discuss the offense, I mean, there's not really much to discuss, to be honest, because our offense was pretty much one-sided and there was no production at all. Saquon Barkley had his first 100-yard rushing game since, I believe, the Texans game last year. And it kind of happened like the Texans game, going to be honest. Like, the Giants didn't win. It was a close game, yes. But Saquon was not efficient on the ground. Like, I'm not saying that's Saquon's fault, but he was used for more carries than, you know, was actually quality. It's kind of a quantity over quality situation as to what the Giants used Barkley for. When it should have been quality over quantity because the Giants could not run the football. A- apart from that big run that Saquon Barkley had. And if you take that off the table, maybe Saquon Barkley goes under 3.5 yards per carry. And we're talking about a totally, totally different situation here. So there's that. And as a part of that, the Giants' O-line did not get much exposure to the pass. Which you could say is a positive because of this O-line, you know... The way they've been playing over the last few weeks has been a mishmash. You know, guys in and out of the lineup. But 52 runs to 14 passes. Talk about one-dimensional. And then I'll get into, you know, some pressure stats and whatnot. So Justin Pugh allowed two pressures, two hurries. Um, I guess PFF liked his pass blocking at left tackle. Uh, Ben Brennison didn't have a great game. I believe that was mostly attributed to the run blocking, though. Um, He didn't allow any pressures or hits, but I guess maybe he was reps I guess that he was losing and just not allowing pressures or anything like that uh John Michael Schmitz allowed a pressure in a hurry uh, I'd have to watch the tape to see you know what he was doing bad or what he was doing good Mark Lewinsky I have to give this guy a shout out I mean he allowed a sack you know to hurry two pressures but he was you know solid in the running game according to multiple people I have to give him credit the Giants are going to have some hands uh, full when Andrew Thomas comes back because they're going to have to reshift this line around. Same thing with Evan Neal coming back. And Glowinski is making it tough for them to sit him right now. And it makes you kind of wonder, with Glowinski in, does that mean Evan Neal was the bad link? Because Glowinski came in, he was benched against the Bills, then Azudu gets hurt, and he goes to left guard. So you can't really make that statement. But he had a very good grade... A very good game, too, against the Commanders. And this game, I mean, his pass blocking was average, but his run blocking was good. So is it Evan Neal that's just being not good? Questions to ask, obviously. Tyree Phillips. Five pressures, four hurries, a hit, no sacks allowed. So there goes that. Um, As I said, I'm not too keen on him at tackle, but for the time being, it's got to make sense. So let's talk about something... That's um, a little bit better for the eye and better for the mind right now. That's the Giants defense, but I do want to get into our ad. That is SeatGeek. So if you guys haven't already used the SeatGeek code, $20 off SeatGeek. Uh, you go to concerts, you go to you know stadiums for tailgates, and you need parking passes. That works. And also as well, well ball games. You, know, you go to a Knicks game, a Rangers game, a Devils game, whatever. Get $20 off. Seeky code, Big Blue in the Bronx. $20 off. Let's talk about this defense. This front seven has been wrecking the last two games. And if you want to go an inch further, this linebacking core has been going and playing like speed demons the last three games because you really didn't see too much of a front emergence. I mean, Kayvon Thibodeau didn't really have a good game against the Bills. Dexter Lawrence did, but he didn't really get in the backfield too much. It was just more pressures and holding penalties. But, I mean, I'll start with one player. I'll start with Kayvon Thibodeau. Now, my main problem with Kayvon Thibodeau is he's not consistent and you need that impact player. But, I will say this. This is the best game I've ever seen him in Giants Blue. Maybe he needs to keep his hair up too. Maybe that's just like uh, an omen. Maybe it's a voodoo thing or it's a, a superstition. 
when those two idiots on WFAN decided to criticize him in so many wrong ways, like the body shaming and, oh, he's not fit to play linebacker and he's got to catch up. I'm like, you guys don't know anything of what you're talking about. And, you know, they shut down Carl Banks on WFAN, which was very childish, I'm going to be honest with you, because he was bringing some good arguments to the table, not arguments I would agree with, to be personal, uh, personally honest, because, like, you know, I don't think he was, I don't think Kayvon was explosive before the Jets game. I didn't think he was consistent before the Jets game. But this game, if we could get this Kayvon Thibodeau for at least most of the games down the stretch, and you're not going to be facing good O-lines. Like, um, the Raiders, I, I don't think they're traditionally good. But, I mean, maybe you could distract Jimmy G in a couple of different things. Uh, after that, Dallas, I mean, I would like to see them show up against Dallas and not get their ass kicked. But we'll see what happens. The Commanders, you got to definitely rain on them again and then the Pats I mean you know their situation with Mac Jones and not scoring points for most of the season you could take advantage of that with that being said though uh with that being said Kayvon three sacks a sack against uh Mekhi Becton and I said it I said I don't think he's gonna win his battles against Mekhi Becton that's my personally honest opinion but if you're talking from a number five overall perspective he should be winning those battles and he did He was dipping the edge. He was rushing with speed, a little bit of power too. And, you know, he was playing karate with Max Mitchell on the right side. And Max Mitchell didn't know what to do with himself. He didn't know what to do with Kayvon Thibodeau. So those are the matchups that you should be winning. Kayvon Thibodeau, eight and a half sacks. Unless he's silent for the rest of the season, he's going to be Wink's first pass rusher over 10 sacks. And I think this is his third multi-sack game. Because he had two sacks versus Seattle. I think he had one against Miami. I think. He had one and a half versus the Commanders. Didn't anything against the Bills. So I think this is his third multi-sack game if you count the halves. Which essentially that's still getting there. But the Giants on defense um, had 31 pressures. 31 pressures. And we'll move to Dexter Lawrence who... The last two games, he's been on fire, and he's been scaring guys. Like He was working Connor McGovern. He was working some of the guys they had in that middle once Schweitzer was out, once McGovern was out. And, you know, it's a shame we couldn't capitalize on a lot of different things because Dexter Lawrence, you know, everyone was talking about Kayvon. Dexter Lawrence had the best performance I've seen from him in a while. 15 quarterback pressures, which per pro football focus, the most in a game by a defensive lineman says J.J. Watt. In 2014, that is absolutely remarkable in every good way possible. And, you know, there's usually those players, right? They regress after a contract extension. Dexter Lawrence has, what, three sacks on the season, and he's got three sacks in the last two games. And I guess with this type of player, you don't need to worry. You really don't need to worry about, oh my God, is this going to be a regression because of the contract extension? He has 44 pressures on the season, which is tied for most in the league with Nick Bosa. And that's interesting because, number one, Nick Bosa got injured the first two games. Number two, Dex coming from the middle. It is harder to pressure from the middle than it is from the outside spots with offensive tackles defending you. So Dexter Lawrence, man, I mean, shout-outs to you. Shout-outs to you. He's got 31 pressures when lined up at nose tackle this season, which the next most is B.J. Hill of the Bengals. And Michael Pierce, I believe he's still with the Ravens at six. I mean, this is an elite player. Um, I'll talk about some worries I have with him later on, but they're not like, oh my God, it's Dexter Lawrence. So there's that. The linebacker is playing like speed demons. Bobby Okereke, Michael McFadden, those guys were making plays. Michael McFadden got on top of Zach Wilson and got the ball on the forced fumble. He made multiple plays. Uh, Bobby Okereke sniffed out a couple of screens, and the Giants were setting the edge really well in the running game. So, you know, Kayvon would push back on a guy, and Okereke would just find his way. I mean, those two guys have really panned out for the New York Giants, and it couldn't have come at a better time with this Leo trade because they are going to need to play at the level they have been, you know, the next few weeks uh, against Tony Pollard, against Josh Jacobs, and especially, again, with this Leonard Williams trade, which we'll talk about. Uh, Deontay Banks, he struggled a little bit versus Garrett Wilson. He had 13 targets, um, seven completions allowed. It was 100 yards at least counted against him. So there's that. And he's going to struggle. He's going to struggle 
Uh, I'm glad the Giants put him up to the test against Garrett Wilson, even though Garrett Wilson kind of bested him and, you know, he had one or two penalties. But hey, listen, it's the rough ins and outs. The Giants drafted Deontay Banks at 25 for a reason. And, you know, from start to finish, he did struggle and had a couple of nice plays, though. But yeah. Um, also, Adori, I mean, he, he was mix and match. Towards the end of the game, he really fucked up, though. Um, in the fourth quarter, big reception, and then the pass interference, which was inexcusable. And I thought Cordell Flott and Jason Pinnock played really well. You know, Pinnock, uh, not much impact from McKinney, at least from what I saw from my two eyeballs. But Pinnock had some really nice pass deflections and pass breakups. And this this game meant a lot to him because the Jets got rid of him. And he was like, I'm going to show you guys. And he did, except the team lost. And Cordell Flott, I mean, there are some situations where he struggles. But man, he's he's come on like he's played really well. He's played really well. The Giants are finally using utilizing him to his strengths, and he makes plays at the best moments. You know, third downs is like where he really plays well, and fourth downs too. I mean, he had that you know obviously last week against the Commanders. So I know I didn't spend too much time on the defense, but um, you know the Giants. It's a shame they didn't win this game. It really is. So I'm going to do a little bit of backwards uh, reverse psychology here. I'm actually going to start with the outlook before we go with the snaps. So I was talking about the Leonard Williams trade. What do I think of it? I, I put out a short about it, but my thoughts on it. Also, if you guys haven't already, check out the video I did with Ron Effect. Uh, Ron's a good guy. He's been my friend for a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, obviously we discussed that trade and our thoughts on it. So what was I talking about with worries and all that? I'm going to get into that now. The Giants are going to take on the rest of his contract, which is this year, uh, $9.3 million. Seattle will only owe him about 600 700k. So the Giants did that. Now, a lot of Seahawks fans are really getting their, you know, pump up and they're pumping their chest. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, say that Leonard Williams is a bad player, but it's very interesting to me that the Giants took on a, a lot of salary to get a bigger Bigger package in return because that's a second round pick. That's four picks in the top 100 next year, and obviously a fifth in 2025. And the Giants are back to seven draft picks. So I think the Giants will need to make more moves as the day goes on, uh, Dory Jackson or anything you could find because seven draft picks is not going to cure all the needs that the New York Giants currently have. And you know, if that quarterback conversation comes up, you could say, Hey, we're going to package this second, we're going to move up, and we're going to select our guy. If the Giants are good enough for their mediocre to win a couple of more football games. But specifically in that Leonard Williams thing, I'm not saying that he's like, you know, he's not a good guy, you know, and all these different things. He's not a good athlete or he's not a good player. He's a solid player. He's not worth $32 million worth of cap hit. Um, with that on the table, though, I will say this. He's, he's not second-round draft pick in a trade-worthy. Now, I get it. The Giants, you know, obviously ate some money for that to happen. I thought Joe Shane had a steal right there. And Seahawks fans, again, punching their chest and, you know, pumping their chest. He's a good player. He reunites with a couple of guys on the Seahawks, Julian Love, Jason Myers, Jamal Adams. But it's not like he's going to get 11 and a half sacks constantly. So maybe Joe Shane eats some money from other contracts and says, okay, we need draft picks like now. We need draft picks urgently. So... One of my main worries with the Leonard Williams trade is how is the run defense and the pass defense going to be impacted? Let's start with pass defense. Leonard Williams was the second best pass rusher on this team. Who takes that role? Is it Jordan Riley? Is it Ashawn Robinson? Is it DJ Davidson? I think it's going to be Ashawn Robinson because he's played really well. I think he's been underrated a little bit. He's got some nice run stops. But it's not just that. And... The running game will get to. I think the running game will take a little bit of a hit. And I think H. John Robinson is going to play well in more snaps. That's where I say the linebackers have to be on their A game for the next how many games and also the rest of the season. Because the Giants are not getting a replacement for Leonard Williams until next season. But who's going to open up those holes for Dexter Lawrence to rain on offensive lines? Is it going to be A. Sean Robinson that's good enough to do that? I mean, the highest amount of sacks he's had in three in the season is like three and a half. So it's going to be up to him, Nacho, and all the other guys to kind of help Dexter Lawrence. And, you know, you should do that because that's what teammates do. That's teamwork. 
Uh, Deontay Banks is cornerback one if Adoree is traded. I would be prepared for that. Um, I think there's a lot to break down. If Deontay Banks is tr- uh, if he- Deontay Banks is traded, if Deontay Banks is corner one and Dory gets traded, his first test is going to be a very very big test against Devontae Adams. Now they might try to put him in zone, or they may try to put him in man with some safety help, but it tells me in a lot of different ways in silences that the Giants trust Deontay Banks as a cornerback one. They wouldn't have put him up against Garrett Wilson if they didn't think so. Um, they wouldn't have put him up a couple times against you know Terry McLaurin and Stefan Diggs. So I think Adoree is traded. That's my little prediction right there. For anything less than a fourth, because um, you know maybe a team offers a second or a third, but I think it, realistically it's like a fourth or a fifth. I, I wouldn't say six or seven because Adoree's still a, a good corner. I just think he's have a, having a very off year for some reason. Um. But his first test would be big, Deontay Banks against Devontae Adams. And it it might be a rough stretch for this Giants defense if that's what happens because you'll end up factoring in Nick McLeod too uh, because I don't think they'll give Darnay the snaps. And, you know, they'll see what they have. And also, as far as this goes, Daniel Jones coming back. uh, Would I think the offense changes a little bit? I think it's going to change in game plan a little bit more. I don't know how much of an impact it's going to have. Because let's just say Daniel Jones comes back a joint with Andrew Thomas. You're still going to have some creaks with the O-line. You know, if Justin Pugh slides over to guard. Um, you know, JMS will still have his struggles at center. If the O-line is average, you're going to get some nice passing games maybe from Daniel Jones. If not, and he's still shell-shocked and he still can't hit open receivers, then it's it's sayonara for him. It's done. Um, I mean, I already said that I kind of want a quarterback next year. However... I'm going to see what I have. We'll see what we have, I should say. Daniel Jones, Tyrod Taylor, and you know all that sort of stuff, good stuff. Um, but snap-wise, let's go to that before we end off the show. Um, as far as offensive snaps, we will start with that first. Uh, ben Bredesen, Justin Pugh, John Michael Schmitz, the entire offensive line played 100% of the snaps. Darius Slayton played 99% of the snaps. Daniel Bellinger at 89%. Along with Saquon Barkley, 80% for Wanda Robinson, 67% for Tommy DeVito, 64% for Isaiah Hodgins, 33% for Jalen Hyatt and Terod Taylor, Darren Waller at 23%, Matt Breed at 11%, 8% for Marcus McKeithen, and 4% for Paris Campbell. Apparently, Campbell is rumored to be among trade talks, but I mean, you're probably getting a box of cookies or a bag of chips for him at best. Giants defensively, uh, 100% of the snaps. Banks, Okereke, um, McKinney, and Jason Pinnock, 97% for Kayvon Thibodeau. And that's really good because he had an injury during the week. I think it was a knee injury. And he wanted to test it, and he played 97% of the snaps and played out of his fucking mind. 83% of the snaps for Dexter Lawrence, 81% of the snaps for Jahad Ward and Leonard Williams, 78% for Dory Jackson, 58% for Cordell Flott and Micah McFadden, 47% for Ashawn Robinson, Isaiah Simmons at 38%, Nick McLeod at 22%, Rakim Nunez Roches at 20%, O'Shane Zimenez and DJ Davidson at 11%, and 8% for Dane Belton and Carlos Boogie Basham. Like, comment, subscribe to all the good stuff, turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops or a video drops. Appreciate all coming back. Again, thanks for the positivity, folks, uh, on social media and YouTube and all this other stuff, you know, regarding uh, the questions I asked Dable and stuff like that. It really means a lot. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Going to try to see, um, you know, if I can get a Raiders guy on. I know I'm going to be doing a couple of different collabs around, uh, you know, YouTube and stuff like that. But we'll keep you updated. Appreciate you guys. Let's go Big Blue after all.